Pastor Benny Hinn has been faithfully preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit for over 40 years. He is known around the world for the anointed healing ministry that God has given to him. His massive crusades, conferences, outreaches, best-selling books, and highly watched broadcasts are making an enormous impact for the gospel. Pastor Benny continues to be one of the most anointed servants of God alive today. His life and ministry have heavily impacted mine. I first began watching Pastor Benny when I was just 11 years old. Over the years, he has become to me a friend, mentor, and father in the faith. And this will be the beginning of the greatest day of ministry in your life. I was privileged to sit down with him recently and discuss the glory of past revivals and the coming move of the Holy Spirit that he says will spread throughout the nations of the world and be greater than anything the church has ever seen. Thank you for coming on to Encounter TV. David, I am so honored. I really am. What a wonderful, wonderful ministry the Lord has given you, and what a wonderful young man you are. Well, I'm happy that you're here, and I just wanted to talk to you because, you know, my generation really is hungry for the power of God. And even though we've seen sort of what I call trickling of the waters of the Spirit moving in our generation, we've not really seen yet what you saw in your day. And while we honor what God did in that day, we want to see God do something just greater than ever before in this generation. And we don't hear a lot about the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit or speaking in tongues. So I want you, just as a father in the faith, just talk to our generation. We're hungry for the presence of the Holy Spirit. So glad to be talking. I really believe this is of God that uh, we're together. And I think the Lord may want me to say more on additional programs. I don't think this is the first and last time we're going to do this. Right. I will tell you something. I believe with all of my heart, you, this generation you're in, you are going to see more than we ever saw when I was young. Because, you know, the Lord, whenever the Lord finishes a, a job, He finishes it big. So, when he moved early in the 70s when I was young, you know, there's a lot of things we saw that's correct. The birth of the charismatic movement, I was, you know, a part of it uh, in many ways. I came in in the early 70s. It, it, it began in late 60s, but the early 70s, it was still strong. And then it kind of weakened in about 76 when Catherine Kuhlman went home to be with the Lord, is when the end of that move, we began to see the end of it, and then we saw the, really the death of it. And then the, uh, a new resurrection came for the word movement, which I believe ended up uh, probably mid-70s. And then we saw another move of God after that. But let me talk about those early days and the first move. The first move that I was a part of, which we know as the charismatic renewal, when David Duplessis was a great leader in that movement. We actually called him Mr. Pentecost. Catherine Kuhlman, Beth Robertson, Derek Prince, Bob Mumford, so many others. And in that move, God did uh, supernatural wonders through not only uh, the gifts of the Spirit, but really mostly through his word being preached with such incredible revelation truth. So, yes, of, of course, it affected my life in, in, a, in a major way. Um, I believe myself that there is going to be another move greater than the charismatic move with greater depth of revelations than we heard because, because, the, the present conditions on earth demand it. So your generation is going to see a revelation of the word I have not seen. I'll tell you what I mean. 
You know, when the Lord began moving in those days, David, um, and I would go to a lot of the meetings. I went to my church Sunday morning, which was uh, under the Watsons at the time. Then Jim McAllister came from uh, the, the U.S. And uh, we had incredible speakers. Cody Tamboom spoke in those meetings. Uh, Derek Prince, Lorne Cunningham, all the fathers came to that church because God used it in a big way called the catacombs. They, they used the big Anglican Cathedral mm -hmm. in Toronto, right there downtown, which was unheard of before that to even think about having a move of God in, in an Anglican church, you know, the Church of England. And that's what God did. And of course, in that move, uh, the prophetic was very, very, very strong. But what was really strong is the revelation that came out of the lips of these preachers that they themselves were discovering. You know, someone would be ministering and then they would stop and the Holy Spirit would take over and they would start speaking the word and some of, sometimes they would start weeping. Other times they would be amazed by what the Lord was doing through them. We did not know that none of that was in their notes. Just the truth of God's word came out of their lips with them not even studying. So it. inspiration right there on the platform. Right there on the platform. Wow. Right there. With, and they would, you know, say later, you know, I, I, I didn't plan on saying this. I didn't know I would say this. I don't know why I said that. All that. But suddenly they would minister with such power while well, the Holy Spirit took over their mouth. Do you remember what it was like sitting in those meetings? Oh, dear God. I remember very well what it was like in those meetings. It was pure glory. But I want to say there are levels of glory because the glory, for example, in Catherine's meetings what was a lot thicker, a lot deeper. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean the presence, the, the atmosphere was charged. The glory in the catacombs was through the preaching. So when, when they would start preaching with such revelation, you were like glued and stunned. Catherine, it was atmosphere. Hmm. So one was word and one was atmosphere. But the word that came through the Watsons, the McAllisters, these were names, famous names, the McAllisters, by the way, in the, in the Pen Pentecostal movement, and others, many, many, many others. Bob Mumford, you know, Derek Prince. When they would minister to us kids, Lorne Cunningham, when they would minister to us kids, we all sat on the floor by the, by the thousands, glued to every word, not realizing at the time that the Holy Spirit was speaking through them as he did the prophets in the Old Testament. So it was so strong and so life-changing where it was joy unspeakable. Hmm. And people would start dancing with their eyes closed. Nobody would bump into any of the seats or the Views. Oh, wow. I saw people dance in the spirit in those days. It was really supernatural. And in those days, we had a lot of visitations of angels, like real visitors of, of angels. Did you ever see them? Uh, yeah, I saw one as appeared as an old man on the highway outside Toronto. He was hitchhiking and we all stopped and you know, that's what I mean by days of such glory. We were out uh, in the farms. We had gone to minister, we young people, in one of the cities, close cities uh, outside Toronto. And we're driving back. And out of nowhere in this wide area, there was no buildings anywhere around to see, all just cornfields. And he was uh, this very uh, sweet, uh, very a live looking man who seemed to be in his 90s 
but his skin was smooth and very red and his hair pure white. He didn't look like a nine-year-old man. He looked very young nine-year-old man hmm. and lit up. His eyes were lit up. His face was lit up. And the most beautiful smile, I'll never forget that. He's hitchhiking. So we all stopped. We were in a Volkswagen. Kids all over the place. I'm sitting in the, in the center, in the back seat. And Bob Tadman was driving, one of the young leaders of the church. And uh, so we stopped. And he said, can you give me a ride? Well, sorry, we don't have much space. We took off. And then one of the girls named Michelle, she said, why don't one of us get out? Let's give him a ride. I'm sure he's not going to go too far. Let's just see what he wants. And maybe we'll come back and pick. Or maybe two of you can get out and you wait and we'll take him wherever we want. And then we'll come back, pick you up. Okay, let's, let's, let's do it. So made a U-turn and he was gone. But there was nothing around. Like he couldn't have gone to a gas station. No gas station for miles. He came out of nowhere. Like, you know, how did he get there? We still don't know. I still don't know. He just showed up. Cornfields. By, we're, we're talking miles and miles and miles and miles of nothing except cornfields. So it sounds to me like, like the glory was in the land. Yeah. And so when we stopped, we made the U-turn and, and went to see him. We couldn't find him. All, all of us went through the cornfields thinking maybe he had fallen or... Oh, you were looking for him. Yeah. Uh, we didn't find him. Such glory days, there was a, a dear man named Don Riling. Don Riling had a church in Rochester. Uh, around the same time, uh, he was in a restaurant and uh, an old man walked in. And the waitress kicked him out. It was about Easter time, and uh, Don went, this pastor whom I knew, went and said to the waitress, why did you kick him out? Oh, he's just nothing but a bum. He said, would you let him back in so he can have, a, he can have dinner? Yeah, yeah, I don't care if you pay for it. He said, yes, I'll pay for it. So he went out, he said to the old man, please come back and you know, have your dinner and I'll pay for it. So the old man came back. And then Don went back to the preachers. They, they were having a meeting in the restaurant, he and a group of pastors. And he just happened to look to see how the old man was doing. He was gone. Hmm. So he goes back to the waitress. He said, why did you kick him out again? I paid his meal. She said, I didn't kick him out. And he went over and looked and his dinner was there and his bread and the utensils. Nobody touched anything. No old man. And uh, in the middle of the night, he's sleeping, Don Riling is sleeping. He wakes up and there's the old man in his room. And the old man says, I was hungry and you fed me today and disappeared. And a revival broke out in his church. That's the kind of thing that happened in those days that I think you are gonna see in a, bit, in a greater way. So when the Lord visited my life in 73, I can't lie about this. I would wake up at night and see angels in my bedroom. What did they look like? All sizes, all kinds of, uh, I, I saw children. I saw the size of uh, young men. Uh, some were quite large, tall I mean. Uh, not, not wide, just tall. And uh, they would look at me in a very puzzled way, almost gave me the feeling of uh, what does God want with him? No, see, that's what I felt when they looked at me, like in a puzzled manner. This happened many, 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 many times at night. So we had a lot of angelic visitations and we had experiences like it happened to me one time where I was translated in the car from a place to another. There was a place called Bizak Center, not far from the airport in Toronto. And we would go there Friday nights. They had big meetings there all the time at Bizak. And a man named Bernie Warren was the pastor. And Bernie was a sweet saint of God. He and his wife Darla. 
and I would go there. It was like a nice farm they had, and uh, people would gather and have services. And the glory of God was really strong at Bizak, always packed out, and um, the big uh, hall. And so I would go there, and sometimes I would say I would stay for the weekends or come early, and just stay there because it was like, like a retreat center. Beautiful farms and beautiful hills and all that. Animals, cows, and, and that's where I learned many of the hymns. I took the hymnal and would sing it on, sitting on a rock somewhere. But anyway, so we are there with a group of young people. There's a lady named Anne, her people were from Britain, and I wanted to go uh, to listen to a preacher from Bolivia. He was an American, uh, sorry, Canadian. Uh, he taught on prophecy book of Daniel and he was speaking in a city called Kitchener Ontario it's quite away from these that so you're talking from the Toronto Airport to Kitchener at a good hour and something drive at least an hour and a half so when we went there it took us an hour and a half or so to drive the way back was 10 minutes we left the church at night and now suddenly we're at this dirt road where Bizak was on this dirt road, those farms. And I said to Anna, I said, that's the same street Bizak is on. She said, there's no way, because we just left the church. Oh my goodness. And the church was on a, on, a, on a dirt road. We didn't even get on the highway. I said, well, it can't be. I said, we just left the church. And the sign, the name of the street was what be like is so it can be maybe it's the same name I said Anne turn left here and if we're at Bizak you know we had a miracle here of course we were kind of you know, freaking out a little bit I said just turn left it was nighttime I said turn left I said, impossible impossible we just left I said look just turn left so she was shaken up we turn left and here's Bizak right back where we we looked at the clock and our watches we said there's no way the lord literally took that car it took us we were on the highway going and no highway coming back just dirt road one dirt road these are the kinds of things that happened back then and we're my generation is hungry for these things but it's going to happen in your generation even more that's what i'm trying to tell you it's going to be bigger, more incredibly powerful. Now, the reason I say that is because it's what God told me is coming. I'm going to see it. I may be a part of some of it, not all of it. And the days you're going to experience are going to be dark days in the world. I mean, dark days in the world, very troublesome days in the world. You know, you've got to understand that the 70s were days of trouble for the world hijackings you know vietnam all that we don't see that today if, if, if you compare the 70s to today it's really quite peaceful out there, there there's no vietnam war going on there's no riots in uh, american universities and so on uh, these are not the days of civil rights and martin luther king and People getting, you know, killed on the streets of America and all, you know, less and less has happened. And we're seeing more peace now in this country and the world, really. But if you look at the conditions of America and the world, they seem to be a little more calm right now in comparison to the 70s. The 70s were, were, were years of incredible trials, Watergate, all that, just go back to Lyndon Johnson, Vietnam, and then Nixon. It was turmoil after turmoil, hijacking by Palestinians and so on. The world doesn't have that. You know, doesn't have to worry about such things today. So, but in times of great darkness and struggle, as we had, there is great light. All right, now, what is coming are days of darkness again. Much worse, much worse than the 70s much worse than you know the vietnam days much worse than watergate days much worse than hijacking days what what is coming is going to be very frightening 
And with that, a revival that will be greater than that. Look, light and darkness are, are equal. God raises the level of light as the level of darkness goes up. So the darker it is, the brighter it is. More darkness, more brightness. That's the way it goes. Because if we read the Bible properly, it says so. Great darkness, great light. If there's darkness, there's light. If there's great darkness, there's great light. So in the days of the early, early church, was great persecution. And what do we read? Great power. So God always matches it with his power. It's never more. It's equal, the amount. So what you're going to see in the coming years here is more trouble, more darkness, more demonic activity, the same amount of glory in the kingdom side. We're, we're going to see great power. So that's why I tell you, you know, you are going to see incredible days coming. I believe with all of my heart that young people like yourself are going to preach with more revelation than I heard from Bob Mumford, Prince, or Lone Cunningham, or anyone else. You're going to speak with such incredible force, and God is going to use you. Where you will hear yourself minister the word, and it will have to stop and say, the Lord is doing this. This is God's doing. It's not something you would study happened to me in the early days. Many times I'd be ministering, speaking, and I would stop. And, and I wouldn't recognize the Lord took, took over my mouth, you know. So that's going to happen. The other thing that's, that, that's going to happen is the signs and wonders would be greater. You know, we didn't see the dead raised, for example, uh, uh, on the scale you will. Yes, the dead were raised here and there, you know, you heard about it, mostly uh, outside America, mostly Africa, South America. And we heard stories, uh, Richard Rombrandt came to the catacombs telling us about the glory that God uh, granted in Siberia to some of the prisoners who were in Siberia, who were pastors in prison for their faith where the Lord numbed the hunger of one of the pastors who was placed in a hole, frozen hole, in the ice in Siberia for three, four weeks, and he was naked in the hole, and the Soviets wanted to kill him with hunger and pain, and when he came out, they could not kill him, and there was uh, nails stuck out of the hole, that if he would lean, he would go into the nails, and that dear pastor stood straight and strong. When they took him out of the hole, he wasn't even cold. He was warm and no hunger whatsoever, was not in need of any water or any food or any warmth. The Lord protected him totally. So when he got back to the cell, Richard Rombrandt, who was with him, Richard Rombrandt, today is, is in heaven, but I saw him. I, he, he ministered to me when I was a little kid, young man, I should say, 19 years old. And I was so touched by his message and ministry. And so you probably heard of the voice of the martyrs, that's his ministry. And uh, when the, his friend, the other pastor, got to the cell, he, he told Richard what happened. And Richard Rombrandt uh, was amazed that the Lord fed him and uh, covered him supernaturally. He didn't even want any food. He was not even hungry or thirsty. These are the kinds of things that will happen again. So God is going to raise the dead in your day. And I think Amen. you need to be, get ready for it and take me very seriously. This is not just an empty thing here, you know. The Lord is going to do these things in your meetings. So, I believe three things are coming. Number one, incredible numbers will be saved. Way more than in our day. Way, way more. On the streets, in the malls, in open areas, schools, universities. 
all will be healed. And I mean all will be healed. Can I ask you there, Miss Coleman prophesied something like that. How close are we to that day, do you think? My opinion, <clears throat> within the next 10 years, and the reason I say it is because I'm watching very closely what's happening inside Israel. There's a revival inside Israel. And when you see Israel restored like they are now, spiritually uh, reawakening, it's just a matter of time before God does it in the church in glorious ways. You know, and the Lord is visiting Muslims today in, in the Arab world. You know, we've been hearing it for years and years about dreams and visions. So there's a reawakening in that part of the world, specifically inside Israel. People don't hear about it, but it's there and very tangible. And that is a sign to us believers. Can you say what you told me about the young people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah? 21% of Jews, young Jews, believe Jesus is the Messiah, yes. So you're saying salvation like we've never seen before. Miracles. Miracles. But, but when it comes to miracles, all will be healed. All, including unbelievers who come to those meetings, will be healed. You know, Jesus didn't heal just believers. He healed unbelievers too, remember that. Right. And so he, he, he healed those who were in covenant and those outside the covenant. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget what T.L. Osborne told me years ago. He said, God heals his people because of his covenant. But those outside the church, he heals because of his mercy. I love that. Yeah. So, and the third thing that's going to happen is you are going to be trusted with more wealth in your hands than we've ever known as Christians. Now, can I be honest with you here? Mm. My generation, they look at anyone who's wealthy as they, they have this, it's a misconception really, because I don't think people really read the scripture. They think that it's a negative thing. And you look in movies or in culture, the wealthy are always synonymous with the villain. And that's something I really am hoping God will break that mindset. Oh, he's going to, he's going to. Because people don't realize the, they need it. The only reason for the wealth is the financing of the last move. You, you won't be able to do it without that. Okay, so let's talk about the book of Acts. God gave them wealth in Acts 4. Why? Why, why did they even ask for it? Why would Barnabas come? Why would others come and give money to the church? of land they sold because it financed the move of God. Right. They took care of the church in those days in, the, in ways we're not doing today. They took care of widows. They took care of orphans. They, they fed and clothed and housed. Uh, you remember in Acts 6, you know, when they came and said, hey, you're, you're taking off the, the, the Jewish people who are local and you're neglecting the Jewish people who are outsiders the Greeks. Uh, and so Peter said, okay, choose men. You take care of that now. But it was a part of the church. That's a part of financing the needs of the, of the community, the church community. And what we're going to see now is a new move where God will finance the coming move, not only in the church, but through the church to the world to evangelize. So you think about, you think about that wealth that came in Acts 4, what was it for? Not only to take care of the needy, but to evangelize, to travel. It wasn't, you know, for free for Peter to go to Jaffa. Mm -hmm. You know, he had people with him. When he went to Caesarea, six men went with him. Who took care of him? He did. Where did they sleep? You know, what did they eat on the way? Uh, the Lord himself, when his disciples, when, when he was in Galilee, and he said, well, let's feed them. Well, it's going to take that much money, you know. We don't have enough. But he knew that he would multiply that food. You know, they had money. They thought about money. When he was uh, in John 4, when he was on the way up to Galilee, and he came into Samaria, and the woman at the well, you know the whole story. Well, they went out to buy food, it says. The disciples were gone to go buy things they needed. Well, where did they get it from? It was supplied by women. In the book of Luke, it says so. 
who ministered unto him from their substance. So God took the needs, took care of the needs for his own son, Paul the Apostle. His needs were met mostly from the church in Philippi. And you keep it all throughout the Bible. And then when there was famine, Paul said, okay, to the Corinthians and Macedonians, I need an offering to take to Jerusalem. And we're going to send it in the hands of trusted men to, to the Holy Land. So, you know, financing the work of the kingdom is in the Bible. Was that something you had to work through in your day? Did God, was there ever that, how do I put this without, but religious? Yes, it was that, very hard and negative, very, absolutely. Yeah. No, I didn't see it. And I didn't even understand it. I didn't see it in the way I do today. The mentality back then was, you know, you're not supposed to talk about it, uh, trust the Lord, you know, he fed the ravens and all that, he'll take care of you. But we never thought about financing, you know, the, the, the evangelistic move of God. We just didn't think about that. It was a poverty mentality. And I think it limited the church in that day. Uh, Catherine uh, used to criticize the full gospel businessmen for the way they took offerings. Why do they do that? Just trust God, you know. But that was the mentality of, of don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. you know, don't say anything. So, uh, Oral uh, changed all that. Oral, Oral Roberts. Roberts changed all that with the teaching he came with seed time and harvest. No, nobody thought about that before that. Nobody. Or even taught it. I think they were all scared. And I was one of them. Uh, I would talk about money with fear and trembling in my meetings. Hoping nobody would be offended, you know, keep it low key and just pass the bucket. And not much came because people were not taught. And so later on, things had to change because you can't build the ministry without, you know, pe people standing by you. How shall they go unless they be sent? It was James Robinson, in my case, who <laughs> bluntly told me something I didn't think he'd say to me. He said, Benny, you're crazy. He said that to me. You're crazy for not asking your people watch you on TV to support you. Because when I began, I said publicly, I'll never send a letter. I'll never send you a letter to ask for money. I'll never, you'll never get a piece of mail from me. And James said, you're crazy. You won't survive. I said, oh, I'm going to trust, because that was my mentality. I'm going to trust the Lord. You know, he'll take care of the ministry. And suddenly, you know, I think, wow, you know, we're needing today 100,000 to more another 100,000 for TV. Uh, when Paul Crouch, when we went on TBN at the beginning, Paul said, okay, I'll put you on free and then pay me when the money comes. Well, I'm thinking the, the, the money is just gonna come by itself, you know? So I got on camera one day and said, well, you know, help me, blah, 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 blah. And people did, but not much. People aren't gonna do anything till they get a, a piece of million in their home. So it was, it was James Robinson who said to me, what are you doing? I said, well, you know, I, I'm not paying for my, for my airtime. And then things changed when Paul said, time to pay. Yeah, time to pay. Well, time to pay means you better, <laughs> you, you better pay. So you've experienced both sides and, and you, yeah, can, you can testify that. People don't realize You can that. do more for the gospel when there are resources in your hand. And that's what it's about, the gospel. It's all about the gospel. Because if you see you, well then, <laughs> that's not biblical. You have to see why are you asking people to give to the Lord's work? Paul the Apostle, why did he ask people? Why did he ask the, uh, the church in Corinth to, to give? To help the saints in Jerusalem. Why would he say, now I'm gonna come see you, but you will pay my way to Rome. To, to the church in Corinth. I, you know, through you, by you, I'm going to keep traveling. He was saying bluntly, you're going to take care of my expenses. So all that had to change in me. And I believe that your generation is going to see Luke 6.38 really fulfilled. We haven't. We've, we've only preached it. We haven't seen it. 
We haven't seen it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down. I haven't I have not seen it. I've preached it, I've read it, I've talked about it, I have not seen it. To be raw, I have not seen that promise fulfilled in my lifetime. You will see it. What are you going to see abundance? We haven't seen. Because the last day harvest will be massive. Massive. So sweeping in of souls globally, miracles all will be healed. Globally. And then yeah. you're talking about a wealth coming to the church so for the purpose to finance of the gospel, that. To finance the gospel. No, to finance what you just mentioned. Yeah. Evangelism must be financed. Miracles must be financed. And you mean by that? Well, that God has to give you the wealth to finance it. As far as taking the message out there, yes. and getting the outreaches out there. You got to back it up. Support it. How do we as the people of God now, doing what we do, position ourselves for what God is going to do. Because I don't, I don't want to miss it. I want to be a part of what He's doing. How do we do that? That is very important what you asked. And I think there's only one way I know to do it. Prepare by spending time in the Word and with the Lord. There is no other way. There's no shortcuts. They recognized they had been with Jesus, says the scripture. You must spend time with the Lord. You have to. The only way to prepare is in His presence. As the scriptures fill your heart. And the Bible is the most amazing, oh, nourishment to the Spirit. I mean, nourish your spirit with the Word of God and watch what God will do with that. But don't read the Bible for mental reasons. Don't even read the Bible for educational reasons. Don't even read the Bible for knowledge mentally. Read the Bible so God can speak to you. Get to know His thoughts. Get to know His mind. Get to know His nature. Look beyond the written letter. Look and see what does it say about God? What does it reveal about God? What does that word say about God? Like the depth of God. It's the Father's will to give you the kingdom. You look at that word, it's powerful. It's not the word, it's what it says about God that it's his pleasure. It's his, the being of God, the, the very pleasure comes out in that word, the very desire of God. It means way more than desire. It's what does it say about God? So I'm not, I'm not reading for God so love the world, which I've read, Many times, so have you, we know it by heart. What does it say about God's heart? It just captures you. Jesus looking at the woman saying, neither do I condemn thee. Oh, oh just a minute. In the law it says she needs to die. Now you're looking at the heart of the master. He who is without sin, fulfill the law. Come on, kill him. Throw that rock. When he looks at him and says, where are they? Where are your accusers? His heart came out, came out through those words. Where are they? And then he says, I don't condemn you. The whole nature of Jesus comes out in those words. So we focus on the words. God wants us to focus on his heart mm. behind the word. So when you read the Bible, look at why did he say that? What's, what's behind it? The whole message is love. Like when I read, you know, when I read the Old Covenant and I see all the details about the law, 
okay, if there's leprosy on your walls, now you do this and you do that and change this and change that and then go back seven days later. What's behind it? Pure love. Pure love. That he so cares. So cares. You know, Jack Hayford sat here in the studio crying one day, looking at the clips from the Crusades. And all he could say in tears and sobbing, Oh, look how he loves his people. Uh, look how he loves his people. We're all looking like, Yay, the miracles! And Jack Hayward, uh, uh, Look how he loves his people. I was stunned. That man was seeing beyond the miracles. Mm -hmm. We have to see beyond the letter now. Look at the heart of Jesus in all this. That's how you prepare. That's powerful. The only way you prepare for the coming. And I, I, I really am encouraged by what you're saying. And I know that as you were talking, there was a hunger stirred. People watching and they want to be a part of that. They want what your generation experienced. We want that for us. It'll be greater. Even more so. But what I want you to do is I want you to just take a moment and pray yeah, for that well. one watching who, who's just, their hunger's being stirred right now. Father, in the name that's above every name, your son Jesus was exalted above the heavens. I pray and I believe that everyone watching, Lord, and listening will be used in the coming days, weeks, and months. Lord, I don't believe this will happen years from now. I believe it's almost upon us. The hour is here. Use them mightily, prepare them gloriously, anoint them with intensity. In the mighty name of Jesus, your Son, that your will and purpose will be accomplished in their life, in the church, and on earth. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Why well, this has been precious. Well, thank Let's you. Let's do it again. Yes, please. I was going to say the same thing. You tell me when. I'll come. Okay. Thank you for doing it, Pastor Benny. Love you. An honor. honor. You. I love it. Well. And support him. Support him. He's a he's a fresh voice from heaven. Thank you for watching Encounter TV. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, help me win souls by spreading the gospel through events and media. Make a one-time donation or become a monthly supporter by clicking on the donate link now.